So one problem that a lot of students have is with research and with citing their research. Uh, you know, students struggle with finding, uh, you know, academic and scholarly sources. Uh, if you're interested in that, I have another uh, video about that. And then also struggle with citations. And I think one problem that students have when they're writing research papers or when they're doing citations is not a problem of being incapable of understanding the rules or why the rules are there, but rather just simply they don't understand what research is for. And because they don't understand what research is for, the rules of citation seem like a bunch of arbitrary, just arbitrary rules that someone set up for no good reason. But when you really understand what research is for, then you understand that citation of your sources actually plays an important role in research. Okay, so the let's start with the big question. Why would you research anything at all? Now, in most cases, if you're a student, you're researching because your professor is requiring you to research. And that's, you know, I guess if you're forced to do something that you're being forced to uh, is for you at that moment the, the reason for it. But why would your professor ask you to do research? Is it because you're going to discover something new or interesting that the professor doesn't know? That's pretty unlikely. I suppose it's possible, but there's more uh, folklore about the student who discovers something that the professor had never heard of before uh, that is actually meaningful. Uh, more often, uh, when students teach me something from their research that I didn't know, it's usually because it's a crackpot theory uh, that uh, never... that scholars don't talk about because it's just silly in some way. But in fact, why have someone research or why would I research for my own work? Well, the reason for research is really to enter into a conversation with other experts. That's really what research is. Now, when we talk about things like basic research, which you know, sometimes I've done basic research in the terms of manuscript research or that kind of thing. Um, what we're doing is we're trying to discover something that no one ever knew before. But even to know that no one ever knew it before, or in the case of medieval scholarship, something people knew, but it's, it's knowledge that has been lost over the centuries and we're regaining it. Uh, even in those cases, you know, uh, we have to know what no one knows. To know that something is basic research means that you know what sort of is already known in the world. Uh, you wouldn't basically research if there's a principle called gravity because we, you know that there is one. And if you're starting to try to prove that which has already been proven, well, you haven't even done your preliminary research right. I uh, remember a conversation I had with a professor, uh, oh, of of my, you know, when I was a student, so this was some years ago, where I, where I basically said, you know, we should really look into this particular subject. And the professor said, the reason we don't look into that is because it's impossible. And I didn't understand what she meant, and she didn't have time, and she just kind of dismissed me and went on. And I thought, I'm going to prove her wrong. And I went... And I started doing my own research, but instead of doing the basic research, which is what I was suggesting, I was uh, looking into what other people had written about it. And soon I discovered what she meant, that in fact, the reason no one tried to demonstrate the thing that I was suggesting is because it was physically impossible for the thing I was suggesting to be true. If I had done a little bit of preliminary research into what other experts had already done, I would have known that there was no reason... Uh, to try to prove this unprovable thing. In point of fact, the thing was already disproven. 
Uh, and that's why experts didn't talk about it. Not because it was a new idea, but because it was a long discarded idea. So any kind of research is part of a conversation that experts or scholars or professionals, you know, I'm using experts to mean both experts in the sense of scholars, but also experts in the, in the sense of professionals in the field, uh, the conversation that they're having with one another about what is important and about what things mean. And how does that conversation happen? Well, sometimes that conversation can happen over coffee, but more often in the broader field, it happens through publication, through articles. They can be scholarly articles and scholarly books. Uh, they can be reports that you're sending within a company. Uh, you know, there can be memos and letters, but these are really communications between experts and in there you get your basic research. And so what research is ultimately is it's not only finding out new things. It is that too, but it's communicating those new things with one another. It's how experts remain experts. You remain an expert by continuing to learn and you learn from other experts. That's really what research is about. So why do we make students do research? Well, we make students do research because they're a student to become an expert in something, right? Uh, you know, um, you know, if you're a, a marketing student, you are a marketing student to become a, an expert in marketing. If you're a chemistry student to become an expert in chemistry, you know, if you're an education student to become an expert in teaching, you should know by the time you're done with your education, you should know more than the average person on the street knows about this thing. And you should know a lot more. You should be someone who, uh, you know, you might not be the number one expert in the world. You might not even be the kind of expert who has a, a, a master's or PhD uh, in the field, but someone with a bachelor's degree in something should be uh, an expert on some level on the subject matter that they that they studied. So, so why do we make students do it? Because we're trying to get them involved in that conversation of experts, because that's how they will become experts by listening to the experts, by paying attention to them. When they read what they've written and write about what the, they've written, they begin to understand those things and they hopefully will themselves become experts too. Okay. So that explains why we want students to do research, but why citations and why are these, you know, little piddly rules? Well, I really hate the way that a lot of uh, instructors teach about citations. They teach about it as being ethical. You're stealing this information if you don't cite it. And yes, there is an ethical component. So I don't want to say that, that there is not an ethical component. There definitely is. Okay. But I actually think that's secondary to the main issue. The main issue of giving credit to someone else for the work that they have done and for their ideas is not so that that person will receive a kind of special pat on the back. When someone cites my work, I don't get a penny from that. I normally don't even find out about it. Every so often I'll run into some reference somewhere. I'll be chasing it down and find it's a citation of something I've written of a, of an article or book that I'm, you know, featured in. Uh, and I didn't even know it existed. And when I see that, uh, the total amount of benefit is I go, hmm, good. Someone read it. That's it. It's worth very little to me personally. Now, I'm sure there are some uh, experts out there, some scholars, uh, some professionals who it gives them a real charge. Uh, and in some fields, you know, they count references so it can make a professional difference. But the truth is that's really only secondary. The real main reason uh, to cite sources is for the reader, not for the person who's being cited, but the person you're citing for. What do I mean by that? Well, why would anyone cite my essay or cite, uh, you know, a chapter I wrote or cite, you know, a quote from me uh, in, in this book or in that article? Why would they do that? Well, they're citing it because they think not only did they get the information from there, but that their reader, if the reader's interested in that idea, they can now go find where that idea came from. And that's the real important part of it. It's about saying, Hey, are you interested in this conversation that we experts are having? And you're interested in that little part of the conversation? Well, here's a little, here's a little thread you can pull to go, uh, unravel that part and find out what's going on with that part of the conversation. 
So when we look at the rules of citation, uh, whether you're looking at the MLA style, the Modern Language Association style, which is the style that we tend to teach in English departments, the Chicago style, uh, which is uh, you know, a very commonly used style, the APA style, or whatever style you're using. All of them operate off of the same basic principle. And the principle is, how do we make it easy for the reader to find the source? So why do we have those rules there? The rules are there so the information is laid out in a reasonable and logical way. So for example, in the MLA style, an MLA style works cited page has hanging indentation. What that means is uh, for every entry, the first line is not indented and every subsequent line of that entry, if it goes multiple lines, is indented. It's kind of like a reverse paragraph system. And students will often look at that and think like, why? Why do I have to learn to do that? This seems rid ridiculous format. Well, when you are a reader who's trying to find a source that someone else has cited, you suddenly realize why. Because by doing hanging indentation, then looking at a work cited page or a bibliography, on the left hand side at the beginning of every entry, the last name of the, of the uh, author is sticking out. It's very easy to find there in alphabetical order. Why is that important? Well, when you look at the parenthetical citation, you'll see if it says, you know, Smith uh, 28, meaning it's found on Smith's book or article, page 28, then you just have to go, go down until you, in alphabetical order, until you find Smith, and then you'll get the full citation to find the book or the article. And then all you have to do is go there and find 28. It's very simple. It's very easy. Right? And so these rules of citation are there to make it easier, not for the person who's being cited, nor really for the writer, but instead for the reader. So they can enter into the part of this conversation that experts are having much more easily and find the things that they want to find. When you start doing research, there's nothing more frustrating than when you find a reference to a source that you're interested in and you look at that source and you, uh, you, and, and you go down and you realize that either they haven't cited the information so you don't know where the author got it from and you cannot verify it in any way or the citation is wrong. There's an error in it and then there, there's an error so bad that you now can't figure out what the right citation is and now you can never find it again. That's a very frustrating thing. So when we're looking at the rules of citation, we're looking at, you know, whether we're doing APA style, Chicago or MLA or any other style, always keep in mind the reason for these rules is not to make your life difficult, but to make the life of your reader much more interesting so you, your reader, and the person you're citing can all be part of the same conversation of experts.